Welcome to Woodville. You guys ready to worship Jesus? Come on, stand to your feet. Let's give God some praise this morning, church, all right? Come on. I was nowhere, you came to my rescue. From the grave I've been raised. When I needed a Savior to save me, Jesus, you made a way. Times blind, but these eyes have been open. Now I walk in the light. And every step on this road I will follow. Jesus, you made a way. Come on. You are the way. securing your promise never standing alone you're the truth you're the life you're my future jesus you made a way i'm alive sing it out i'm alive in the love that you give me free to dance once again you will lead me from glory to glory jesus you made a way you are you are the way. God, we sing your praise this morning, Lord. 
all for you, Jesus. Everything we have this morning, God, we lay it at your feet, God. All we have, Father, for you. These songs are for you, Lord. Thank you, God. You give life. You are love. You bring life. Sing it out.
sing this bridge again, all the earth, church, with everything you have, all that we have, I pray this morning, God, this is 100% for you, nothing else, Lord, but the glory of you, God, so Father, we sing with all that we have, Lord, we'll shout out your praise, God, with one voice, church, come on, let's sing it out, all the earth, all the earth will shout, come on, let them hear you. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing, great are you, Lord. Yes, God. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing, great. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
Father. Yeah, come on, give him praise. We thank you, Lord. Oh, we sing your praise, Lord. Put our hope in you, Lord. All our trust is in There's some of you in this room this morning that maybe you need to declare this in faith. Maybe it's not easy for you to say that, Lord, I'll put my trust in you, that you're my foundation. I think some of you need to speak this out in faith this morning. You need to declare it. You need to remind yourself. Maybe you're going through something that's not bearable on your own. I really believe this song is for this morning. We're going to sing this bridge again. I, put my, I build my life upon your love. You're my firm foundation. I put my trust in you. Some of you can sing this with pure confidence, and some of you may not quite be able to be there yet, but I encourage you, can we sing this out in faith this morning? God, we put our trust in you. We can build our life upon your foundation, Lord, not our own. We can't do it on our own, God. But Father, we build our life on your foundation, the foundation of Jesus Christ and the grace and the love that you've given to us. Father, that's what we build off this morning. Church, let's sing this again with all that we got. And let's declare that he is our firm foundation. He's all we got, amen, church? Come on, sing this out. I'll build my life. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken.
people are ready for God's Word. I want you to pull out your sermon guide. It is on the back of your bulletin, or you can pull it up on your handheld device. We do have Wi-Fi in the auditorium, and we are right smack in the middle of a three-part sermon series called Ordinary or Extraordinary. And uh, we're looking at Hebrews chapter 11, and we're looking at three people in Hebrews chapter 11, that great faith chapter that seemed ordinary, but we're discovering that faith brings the extra to the ordinary. You see, when you look at your life, you see ordinary, but when God looks at you, he sees extraordinary. Last Sunday, we looked at a man in the Bible named Noah, and we talked last Sunday about Noah, ordinary guy. And this morning, we're going to look at a man in the Bible named uh, Abraham. You might remember this song when you were in Sunday school. This is how it goes. Father Abraham had many sons. You know it, don't you? Many sons had Father Abraham, for I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Abraham gets 12 verses in this great faith chapter. He gets more about him than anybody else. And we're going to look at this man in the Bible, Abraham. Now, we're going to look this morning at four faith principles that will help your faith, help your life be extraordinary. But before we do that, I want to, I want to, before we even read the scripture, I want to share with you one thing that honestly can stop you from living a life of faith. And here it is. It's your emotions. And, and I think many of you will understand this, that your emotions can hijack your faith. You try to live in faith, but then you get gripped by fear. Anybody ever been fearful before? Anybody willing to admit? Come on, lift up your hand. You had that emotion of fear. Anybody ever had anxiety before? Anyone willing to say, yeah, I've had anxiety? How about anger? Anybody willing to say anger? There's always more hands for the anger one. I know how it goes. And your emotions can hijack you. And here's what happens. Your emotions affect your cognitive thinking, and it stops you from choosing a walk of faith because faith is a choice. And I, I want to declare at the beginning of this message to not live by your feelings, but walk in faith. Amen? Because your feelings will hinder you from living that life of faith. And everyone in the house this morning can understand how those emotions can overtake. And here's what happens when the, the emotion of fear or anxiety or worry or, or what it is just comes in your life, you start to climb up the ladder of, of conclusion. And some of us climb up that ladder so quickly that we go, oh man, it's over, it's finished, it's, it's not going to change. And you jump to conclusions that you should never jump to. So hear me this morning, your emotions can hijack your faith. And so at the very beginning of this message... I say to all you in the risers, all you in the main level, all you way up in the balcony, and all you that are watching this service live streaming, I want us to not walk in our feelings, but to live a life of faith. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Why don't you get your Bible on, turn to Hebrews chapter 11, and I want to read to you three verses, and then I'm going to share with you quickly four faith principles that will help us to live that extraordinary life, because faith always brings the extra to the ordinary. We're going to start with verse number eight. First two words are by faith. Could you say those words with me? One, two, three, by faith. Let's say it again real loud. One, two, three, by faith. Abraham, when called to go to a place where he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and he went, even though he did not know where he was going. Now, the backstory of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, is actually the latter part of Genesis chapter 11 and into chapter 12. So you're not going to see these verses on the screen, but if you brought your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 11, and at the end of Genesis chapter 11, you're going to discover that Abraham's father was a guy named Terah. And I don't have the time to give you all the backstory, but in Joshua chapter 24, I believe it's verse 12, 
you will discover that Tira was not a God worshiper. He actually was an idol worshiper. Imagine that. Abraham's father was not a God worshiper. He was an idol worshiper. Why do I share that? Because some of you are sitting here today thinking, how can God bring an extraordinary life to me, Mark? You don't know my family background. You don't know my parents. You don't know all that's gone on. You need to hear me today. Your past does not define you. Jesus defines you. Amen? And so Abraham, you need to understand that. So Terah was his dad. Now, if you look in verse 31 of Hebrews chap- or Genesis chapter 11, Terah took his son Abraham, his grandson Lot, his daughter-in-law Sarah, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans. They left this area, and they, they started to move towards Canaan. But look at the latter part of verse 31. When they came to Haran, they settled there. Settled. I mean, I'll tell you how far that Abram's father could take him is just to this place called Haran. Then the Bible says, uh, Tira lived 205 years, and then he died. Then you come to chapter 12, and they're settled in this area called Haran. But then the Lord speaks to Abram and said, go, leave your country, Abram, leave your people. I mean, Abram had a job, he had possessions, he had a place. And God says, I want you to not stay settled in Haran. I want to take you somewhere. I want to take you into this promised land. And then God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless the nations through you. And I'm going to bless those who bless you. And and great things are going to happen. And Abram is 75 years of age. And God calls him to a place he's never been before. Hear me this morning. In order for you to be what God wants you to be. Sometimes you have to go and do what you've never done before. That's called living a life of faith. He's 75 years old. And he's married to this lady named Sarah. And Sarah's about 10 years younger. She's like about 65. He's about 75. And then God says, you're going to have this great big family. All this blessing's going to go through you. But here's the problem. Sarah was barren. She couldn't have a child. And Abram is this old guy. In fact, we're going to read in a few moments in the book of Romans, he was described as good as dead. That's not a compliment. Please, ladies, do not look at your husband and say you're as good as dead. And that's what the Bible says. He's 75 years old. She's like 65. She's barren. They can't conceive. And then 25 years later, he's 100 years old. Sarah is like 90 years old. I don't know what kind of old spice he was wearing. But all I know is she conceived, and they had a child, and they called him Laughter. That's what the name Isaac means, Laughter. Now, I don't know about you. If I was 100 years old and Evelyn got pregnant, I don't know if I'd laugh or cry, to be honest with you. And, uh, but, but they called Isaac Laughter. 25 years they waited for the promised child. But verse 8, Abraham, according to Genesis 11... Get this in your spirit. He didn't stay in Haran. His daddy got him to Haran. Then his daddy died, and God called him farther. Now, church, we got to make a decision today that we're not going to be settlers. We're not going to stay where we are at. We are going to press forward to be all that God wants us to be. Amen. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna live by faith, not by our feelings. Now, fear could have hijacked Abraham's feelings, and he could have stayed in Haran. So that's it. I'm staying here. That's all my daddy took me to. I'm not going any further. Where's this child? I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm 75. I'm 85. I'm 95, and I'm still waiting. But he lived a life by faith. Now look at verse 9 of Hebrews chapter 11. By faith. Let's say those words again. By faith. One, two, three. By faith. He made his home in the promised land. He's now in Canaan. He's in the promised land. He lived like a stranger, this is what the Bible says, in a foreign country. Now, some of you are like, well, but that's the promised land. Why is he living like a foreigner, like a stranger in the promised land? Come on, pastor, it's the promised land. Shouldn't he like, this is cool, I'm in the promised land, this is all good. Stay with me. You're going to discover a truth in just a moment. 
Because, because I've already established that your emotions can hijack your faith. But in just a moment, I'm going to give you a principle that will help you to live by faith. Now, verse 9, he makes his home, promised land, like a stranger, foreign country, and he lived in tents. Now, you've got to understand it. He's in Canaan. He's in the desert. Now, if I was in a tent at a nice campground in one of the southern states with the ocean near me and palm trees, I'd like it. But out in the middle of a desert in a tent wouldn't be all that fun. And he's in a tent, and he's there with his son, or with his, with his, with his wife, Sarah. And, and he's waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. And he's waiting, and he's waiting, and he's waiting. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as eventually did his son Isaac and Jacob. What you need to understand is that Abraham's faith influenced his family. It says, who were heirs with him of the same promise, but for 25 years he waited for Isaac. How did he live by faith when, when, when he's in that in-between place, waiting for the miracle, waiting for God to bring the son? The answer is found in verse 10. And Woodville, I want you to hear me today, the way that you can live by faith is to fix your eyes on the home of your soul. And the home of your soul is heaven. Now look at verse 10. For he was looking, doesn't say backwards. It says he was looking forward. Hear me this morning. God doesn't want you to look back. God wants you to look forward. What was he looking forward to? To the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. I want you to hear me today. Abraham had a healthy understanding of who God is. And some of you this morning, why you struggle walking in faith is you don't have a healthy understanding of who God the Father is. I mean, you're cool with, with Jesus. You, you understand the Jesus thing, but you're not clear on God the Father. And I'll tell you why some of you struggle. When you were growing up, and you were at home, and you did something wrong, and your mama caught you, and when you stopped lying to her, admitted that you did it, and, and she looked at you, there was something you never wanted your mom to say, and you would say to your mom, please don't tell, come on, what's the answer? Dad. And I'll tell you why, because you, some of you, some of you, your image of God the Father is based on upon a negative image of earthly father, and you think that God the Father is in heaven with his long nose, and he's looking down at you, and he dislikes you, and he's out to get you, and he's out to make your life miserable, and he's out to get you filled with problems. Church, here is the theology of God the Father that Abraham understood, and it's this. God the Father loved him so much. And I want to declare in this place today to every one of you, you got to get this, God loves you more than you can ever imagine. How many people believe that? That God, come on, how many people believe that? That God really loves you. He honestly loves you. And the theology, the understanding that Abraham had of God was that God loved him. And here he is, walking by faith. He didn't want his emotions to hijack him, and he's now in a desert. He's in the promised land. He's in Canaan, and he's waiting for the promised son. And 25 years go by. How did he hold fast? How did he walk by faith? The answer, church, is verse 10. He looked forward to the home of a soul. He looked forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builders is God. Church, you need to hear me today. The only way for you to truly continue to walk in faith is to fix your eyes on heaven and fix your eyes on Jesus. Do not look at this world, but look at Jesus. How many, I know the answer to the question. I really love asking questions that I know the answer to because I want to hear you give the answer. So here's the question, and I think I know the answer. How many people this morning can't wait for heaven. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. That's about 25 of you this morning. You're so, you're so, you're so caught. Sometimes we get so caught on earth because this is what we see. This is what we know. Now, now somebody said this to me a few weeks ago, and here it is. If you're a believer 
in Jesus Christ, the only hell that you will know is what you're experiencing today. But if you're not a believer of God, this is scary, the only heaven you will know is what you're experiencing on earth today. Church, let's not fix our eyes on this world. We are like a pilgrim. We are like a foreigner in a strange land. We are here for a limited period of time, but we're going to spend eternity in heaven. Someday, we're going to see the face of Jesus Christ. Someday, we're going to be in the presence of our Lord. Come on, Woodville, now I'm preaching. We're going to be in the presence of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'll tell you how Abraham survived by faith is he didn't look back to where he came from. He didn't look to where he was. He looked forward to a city whose foundations and architect are built by God's church. I can't wait to spend eternity in heaven. It's not the streets of gold that I can't wait to walk on. It's not the walls of heaven. It's to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. It's to spend, it's to, come on, come on, get on your feet this morning. Come on, get on your feet this morning, right now in the message. I can't wait to get into the presence of my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. Stay on your feet for a moment. Some of you are walking through the most difficult, darkest, challenging time. And it's not easy. And you're sitting in a place in in your life that you're, you're struggling. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ. Lift your eyes and focus on heaven. Heaven is the home of your soul. Earth is the home of your body. In this world, you shall have trouble, but we shall overcome. And someday, we're going to get to heaven and be in the presence of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. If I were you this morning, I'd be putting my hands together and lifting my voice and giving a shout of praise to the the Lord God Almighty. Woo! Take a seat in God's presence. I want to give you very quickly this morning four faith principles. Four faith principles because faith always brings the extra to the ordinary. And the first faith principle, number one, is faith embraces adventure. I'll tell you what adventure is. It's, it's a risk. Adventure is stepping out of your comfort zone. Uh, adventure is doing something you've never done before, and it's, it's risky. It's, it's, it's like it's a little on the edge. So I got a couple of questions. Anybody this morning ever, ever, ever jumped out of an airplane with a parachute on? Anybody? Lift up your hand. Anybody? You did? Way to go. And you're all right. It's great. You're all right. You're here. All right. Anybody, anybody this morning ever had a rope tied to you, you did that bungee jump thing. Anybody, 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 lift up your hand. Pastor Brad, you actually did that? That explains everything right now. (laughs) I'm teasing you. You actually went bungee jumping. Come on, this guy guy went bungee jumping. Come on, give him a little hand, wow. You daring guy, you daring guy. Now, when we speak of adventure, we think of bungee jumping. We think of, we think of jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. We think of those, those risky things. But, but when I say adventure, faith embraces adventure. I'm talking about faith embracing a God venture. It takes a man who's in Vancouver with a call of God on his life to go to the other side of the world and to start a church to leave the comfort of Vancouver. Why? Because God said, Go. I don't have an elastic band with me this morning, but the elastic band principle is this. The further you stretch the elastic band, the further it would go. Church, the more God stretches you, the further he can take you. And so you can settle in Haran, or you can say, no, I'm going to let the Lord have his hand on me, and I'm going to walk by faith, and I'm going I'm I'm to let the extraordinary happen. Now, in Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham, and he steps out and he goes. And you come to verse number 5 of Genesis chapter 12. Here it is. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, 
and they arrived there. Hear me, church. You were created by God for God ventures. But inside of you is this, this outcry for security and safety. And so, so God says, adventure, and you're like, but I don't want to venture. I, I want to know that I've got a house with a roof over me. I want to know that I've got a nice retirement plan. I, I want to know that I can be near the grandkids. I, I, I want to know that, that everything's comfortable and good and secure and fine. And church, we can settle in Haran or we can take the call of God, whether you're 75 or 15 or creeping towards 100 or somewhere in between, God has an adventure for your life. It might be you going by the table where our missionary friends are at saying, I, I, I think the Lord's calling me for a season to go overseas. And I don't know what it means, but I, I want to do what God wants me to do. The God adventure might even be you dropping by the connect wall and saying, I, 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 we're going to open our home for a connect group. We, we, like, you know, we're not going to worry any longer how tight it is. We're just going to open our home and see what God does. Or it might be you saying, I will do what you want me to do, God. I will go where you want me to go. I want to live a life by faith. Now look this way. I know what I'm about to say is true. If you settle you will survive. But if you walk in faith, you will thrive. And the happiest believers are those that live out their divine design and say, Lord, I might be retired, but what's next? Lord, what do you want me to do? It might be you tomorrow at the lunch table at work sharing your faith with a colleague. It might be you going to school and, and inviting a friend to come to church next week. Church, let's not settle. Let's experience God venture. Somebody give a clap offering of praise to the Lord. Come on. Number two, number two, faith endures with patience. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to read these verses, but last weekend, one of the great pillars in our church, Eugene Shu, and I remember the first time I met Eugene, it was, it was 17 plus years ago, as Evelyn and I were in his home, and uh, we were meeting with a group of about 15 people that were the pastoral search committee, and Eugene was the chairperson and just engaged as they interviewed us and here we are. Eugene and Dorcas have been in this church for years. I'm telling you, years. Last Sunday when we were in church, he had been transferred from the Queensway Carlton Hospital to the Civic Hospital. And, and uh, they discovered, as I learned after church last Sunday, that he has a brain tumor. And this past Thursday, surgery took place. And they removed the brain tumor. And he's getting ready for some chemo and radiation. I'll tell you, friends, that man, that wife, and that family are walking a road that they've never walked before. There were several people in the first morning service whose spouse is in hospital and, and walking through some challenges, and it's difficult. And I just want to say to you, church, your emotions can hijack you. But we're not going to let our emotions hijack us. We're going to walk by faith, and we're going to cling to the Lord God Almighty who is faithful at all times. And I'm going to read to you a few verses about, about patience. And, and, and let's go to Romans chapter 4. Because Paul was writing to a church in Rome. And in Romans chapter 4, he started to reflect on this Abraham story. And this walk by faith. And I'm going to pick it up in verse 18. You're going to see it on the screen. I'm going to read down to verse 21. Paul said, therefore, the promises come by faith. Therefore, the promise. Sorry, let's jump down to verse 18. Against all hope. Abraham, in hope, believed. I mean, everything's going against him, against all hope, but Abraham, in hope, believed. And so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be, I love verse 19, without weakening in his faith. He faced the fact his body was as good as dead. There it is. <laughs> there it is. But he didn't weaken in his faith. He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Look at verse 20. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened 
in his faith and gave glory to God. He didn't weaken in his faith. He was strengthened in his faith. Look at verse 21. I'll tell you how. Being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Now let me read to you Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11 and verse 12. Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter. Let me read verse 11 and verse 12, talking about Abraham. The writer said, verse 11, Hebrews 11, And by faith even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him, God that is, faithful who had made the promise. And then verse 12, and so from this one man, and he, as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Now I want you to turn to one more scripture before we move to the next point. And I want to share something with you. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis chapter 15, Abraham is between promise and fulfillment. He's in between that 75 years of age and that 100 years of age waiting for his wife to conceive. And so he takes matters into his own hands. And in verse 2, he kind of looks to God and says, okay, God, what about Eliezer? He's, he's in my household. Maybe, maybe, maybe he can be my heir. Now, now, here's the deal. I think when I read about Eliezer, it was like Abraham willing to settle for second best. And I want to say to the house this morning, don't you settle for second best. Always go for God's best. Then you come to chapter 16. He's still waiting. He's still waiting. And Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But the Bible says that she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar, verse 2. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children, so you go sleep with my slave, and perhaps I can build a family through her. You know the story, Ishmael. And church, I need to tell you this, and this is a mistake that many people make. They try to solve the problem and take the matter out of God's hands and try to bring forth the miracle. i got to say this. When you take matters into your own hands, you will mess it up big time. How many people know we need to let God do what he does best? Come on, how many people know we need to let God do what he does best? I want to show you something that we're going to put on the screen. It's Genesis 15, verse 1. And I couldn't wait to share this verse. And I believe this verse is for many of you in the place today. The Bible says in Genesis 15, verse 1, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. Let's push pause. Why did God say that? Because fear was the emotion that was gripping Abram, and it was stopping Abram from walking and living in faith. And he starts to climb up the ladder of conclusion. And so God said to Abram, do not be afraid, Abram. Here it is. I am your shield. Think about it. A shield. What does a shield do? It protects you. And, and God didn't give him a shield. God gave him himself. And he said to Abram, I'm your shield. A shield speaks of protection. And then he said, I'm your shield, your very great reward. And reward speaks of provision. And I think the Lord wants me to say in the house today, God is your provider and God is your protector. And when you are walking between a promise and the miracle and you're walking by trust and you're holding on to God, you're, you're Eugene and Dorcas Shue and the family and your others in our church family walking through a difficult health situation, look up to God, fix your eyes on him. He is your protector. He is your provider. Come on, Woodville. Give him praise in this place today. He's your protector. He is your provider. I want to take you to number three. And we've actually camped on this already, so I'll quickly give you this. Faith enjoys the hope of an eternal city. 
Now I want to read to you some words in Acts chapter 7. And in Acts chapter 7, Stephen is talking to the Sanhedrins, and he picks up the story of Abraham. Let's pick it up in verse 3. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. I mean, he had to live by faith. Now let's go over to Hebrews chapter 11. And let me read to you for, again from the great faith chapter. And let me read to you Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Down to verse 16. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They didn't receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Right? We're foreigners. We're strangers on earth. This is not our home. Verse 14. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. Verse 15. If they have been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. I love verse 16. Instead... They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Amen. Praise the Lord. Your emotions will rob you and hijack your faith, but fix your eyes on heaven. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Amen. The final thought that I want to give to you this morning, the final faith principle is this. I couldn't wait to share this one. Faith expects the supernatural. How many people believe nothing is impossible with God? Come on, how many people believe nothing is impossible with God? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Abraham did. In just a moment, we're going to read the scripture, and the, and the back story is Genesis 22. And Abraham now has Isaac, and God says, take Isaac on the top of Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. Now, if God told you to do that, you might look at God and say, uh-uh. Abraham said, okay. He got his knife, he got the wood, he got his son, and they're walking up Mount Moriah, and Isaac goes, hey, Dad, you got the wood. And you got the knife, but where's the sacrifice? Do you remember what Abraham said? He said, the Lord will provide. Remember Genesis 15? The Lord is your shield and your reward. He's your protector. He's your provider. And so Abraham gets on top of the mountain. You know the story. He's ready to sacrifice his son. He's ready to do it. And God stops him. We know the story. But I want to read to you some powerful verses from Hebrews chapter 11 now. In the great faith chapter, verse 17 down to verse 19. And then we're going to close with Romans chapter 4, verse 17. In Hebrews chapter 11, by faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises. Embrace them. Pastor Brad, I'm going to need you again. Come on up. You know where this is going. Come on up. Give the man a hand. He bungee jumped. <laughs> now, Pastor Brad, come here. Come here. Look at the Bible. Look at this. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice, he would have embraced, embraced the promises. Now, now, Pastor Brad, look this way. Look this way. I'm, I'm, I'm going to illustrate Abraham embracing the promises. <clears throat> now, he knew this was happening in second service, but in first service, when I embraced him, he embraced me. And so, so I think the teaching is this. The, the, the God who has already embraced you, when you embrace his promises, he keeps on embracing you. Abraham embraced the promises. His faith, Pastor Brad, was so strong. Look at this. Look at this. God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He would embrace the promises, was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said, him, said to him, it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Now look at verse 19. Abraham reasoned. 
that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Pastor Brad, Abraham's faith was so strong that he knew if he was on Mount Moriah and he actually sacrificed Isaac, he knew that Isaac was the promised child. And if Isaac was going to be dead on the mountain, God's just going to have to raise him back to life because God had given him a promise. And Pastor Brad, you and I know that when God gives a promise, he's a promise keeper. And you and I know, Pastor Brad, that God can raise anything to life. Come on, come on. I want you to know that your marriage might feel dead, but how many people believe Jesus can bring it back to life? Come on, how many people believe Jesus can bring it back to life? There's a lady in our church that we're going to have her share a bit of her story in a couple of weeks. And for the past number of years, it was dismal and dark. And it, but I'll tell you, she came up to me as the service started, and she gave me an envelope that I have that has doctor verification that what was is no longer, because I'll tell you why, King Jesus did a miracle. Come on, give him praise. Give him praise. Hebrews chapter 11. Abraham reasoned. I mean, he had settled it in his mind. And he had settled it in his heart. And he did not let his emotions hijack his faith. He did not let his cognitive thinking stop him from walking by faith. There's some of you today, you're gripped by anxiety, you're gripped by fear, you're gripped by worry. I believe Jesus is going to set you free today. A church, we got to embrace his promise and walk by faith. Now I'm going to give you one more verse, one more verse, and it's in Romans chapter 4, verse 17. And Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and he himself is reflecting on Abraham's faith And there's a powerful verse that I felt I needed to leave you with this morning. It's verse 17 of Romans chapter 4. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He quotes the Old Testament. He then says, he is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. But then Paul described the God who Abram believed. I love this. The God who gives life to the dead. Here it is. And calls into being things that were not. When he created the world, he said, let there be light. There wasn't light before. But when he says, let there be light, how many people know there's going to be light? When he said, let there, be, let, there be, let there be land, there was land. When he created man that never was, there was man. Church, God calls that which is not into existence. And there's some of you sitting here today, the enemy is playing havoc with your mind. And it's stopping you from living an extraordinary life. And your emotions are taking over. And I believe the Lord wants to say in the house today that he wants to open the windows of heaven in this place. And here's what I believe. I believe that God wants there to be a supernatural intervention in this place. I'll tell you what I'm believing for. I'm believing this morning that cancer is going to be gone in the name of Jesus. Anxiety is going to be gone in the name of Jesus. I'm believing for a supernatural outpouring of the Lord. So get on your feet right now and give one loud clap offering of praise to the Lord God Almighty. Come on, to the Lord God Almighty. To the Lord God Almighty. Stay on your feet. Look this way. I believe there's three things that God wants to do in this place. Three things are going to happen. Number one, in just a couple of moments, I believe there's going to be a number of you they are going to make a decision to ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Secondly, I believe that there's a challenge that needs to be sounded right now. That there's going to be a number of you that are going to make a decision to live a God adventure. And then number three, I believe as we open this altar that Jesus is going to show up. And I believe that there's going to be signs and wonders that follow the proclamation of God's word. I'm going to ask that every head would be bowed. And everyone's eyes would be closed. And as her heads are bowed and her eyes are closed, my first thing that I want to ask is this. Are you ready for that eternal city? 
whose foundations were built by God. He's the architect. Are you ready for heaven? If today was the day that you stepped into eternity, are you positive beyond any shadow of doubt that you're ready for heaven? Have you personally asked Jesus Christ into your life? Going to church doesn't make you a believer. Putting money in the offering doesn't make you a believer. Reading your Bible doesn't make you a believer. You have to personally ask Jesus Christ, who's the only way to the Father, to come into your life and forgive you of your sins. Was there a time, a place that you repented and asked Jesus to come into your life? I believe that there's a number of you today that you can't answer that question, I'm ready for heaven, but you want to be ready. And in just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to be ready. We're going to lead you in a prayer in just a moment. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And I think there's another group of you that you at one time asked Jesus Christ into your life, but you've turned your back on God. And today you want to settle it. So my first question is, are you ready for heaven? And the risers up in the balcony... On the main level, you're watching live streaming of today was the day that you stepped into eternity. Sir, ma'am, young person, adult, are you positive that you're ready for heaven? If you can't answer that question with a definite yes and you want to be ready, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. And after I count to three, if you want to be led in this prayer of receiving Jesus Christ, I want you to lift your hand in just a moment. And by lifting your hand, you're letting me know, Pastor, I, I want to be ready. I want Jesus to be the center of my life. I want him to come into my life. I want a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I want to settle this Christianity thing. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I sense in my spirit that there's a large number of you in the second morning service that if today was the day that you stepped into eternity, you wouldn't be ready, but you want to be ready. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to count to three. And if you want to be included and led in this prayer, I want you to lift your hand after I count to three. One, two, three. High as you can. High as you can. High as you can. High as you can. Hands are going up all across this place. Way up in the balcony. High as you can. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. You can put your hands down. And if you lifted your hand, I want to lead you in a prayer. And something we do often at Woodville is we're going to join you as you pray. So let's pray together this morning. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I, ask you into my life. I ask you into my life. Please forgive me of my sins. Please forgive me of my sins. Today, Today I, have I have decided to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus. I settle it in my heart. I, it in my heart. I, invite you I invite you to be the center of my life. I repent, today. I repent today. I receive you today. I, you today. I, confess, you today. I confess you today. I pray this now. Pray this now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. I want you to open your eyes and go ahead and celebrate salvations. Come on, Woodville. Celebrate salvations. There's a lot of people that lifted their hands that they gave their heart to Jesus Christ this morning. And if you lifted your hand and you accepted Christ, you made the best decision of your life. And if you don't attend a Bible-believing, life-giving church, how many at Woodville will be honored and pumped if they joined us in the journey? I know I would be. I honestly would be. And in just a couple of moments, when this service comes to a close, we want to encourage you to go on the main level in the lobby to a wall that says follow. And there's some friendly people there. If you don't own a Bible, we have a Bible for you. It's free, honestly, no strings attached. We have a little booklet. It's free, no strings attached. And if you've accepted Jesus Christ in your life, we encourage you to take the next step, get baptized in water. We give opportunity for water baptism first Sunday of each month. We have a water baptism moment next Sunday. They can tell you more at the follow wall. Now look this way, number two. The second thing is this. God has called you to adventure. God venture. And here's what I want to ask you for the next seven days. Five minutes in the morning when you get up, you're getting your coffee ready, you're brushing your teeth. I want you to pray and say, Jesus, show me the adventure that you have for me because I want to be obedient. And then five minutes at night before you go to bed, say, God, show me the adventure that you want me to do because I want to be obedient. In Psalm 92, early in the morning, late at night. Now, now I'm going to put you, I'm going to call you on it right now. I, I want, you're going to lift up your hand in a moment. How many are going, yeah, I'm in. Mark, next seven days, five minutes in the morning, five minutes at night. I, I'm, 
I'm 75, but I'm in. I'm 15, I'm in. I'm single, I'm in. I'm married, I'm in. I'm, this is my first time here, I'm in. I'm, I'm going to pray because I want God's adventure. Come on, you want God's adventure, and you're going to commit for the next seven days, five minutes in the morning, five minutes at night, for the next seven days, you're going to pray and ask for his adventure. Lift up your right hand. Come on, come on, come on. I'm calling you to it. God's adventure. I promise you this. The more you open your hearts, God is going to show you. God is going to show you. And I can promise you this. When you step into the God venture, you'll be the happiest believer on the planet. Woodville, let's not settle in Haran. Let's not be like Abram's father. Let's, let's go all the way. Let's let the Lord stretch us. Let's do things we've never done before so we can reach people that we've never reached before. Let's say, God, I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. Take me and use me. How many people believe God wants to release an adventurous anointing in this house? I believe it. I believe it. Now, this is number three. And I'm, my faith is just childlike this morning. I believe that God wants the supernatural in this place. I believe there's a lot of you that you've been walking through anxiety. And the enemy's been playing havoc with your mind and your emotions are hijacking your faith. You want the Lord to set you free from fear and anxiety. I think there's a number of you this morning that you need a miracle in your home, and your marriage. There's many of you that need a miracle in your body. I'm just believing for the supernatural. So here's the deal. How many of you people this morning need a supernatural divine intervention in your life? Just lift up your hand. Go ahead. Lift up your hand. Don't put your hand down. Here it is. If you need the supernatural intervention and you want to receive a miracle this morning, I want you right now to leave where you're standing and come and flood this altar. Come on. Come on. Maybe you didn't lift your hand, but you need a miracle. Come on. I believe anxiety is going to be gone this morning. I believe cancer is going to be gone this morning. I, I believe that God's going, to, God's going to bring to life stuff and areas in your life that have been dead. Come on. Come on. You need a miracle. Come on. Don't wait. Come on, front to back, side to side, up in the risers, way up in the balcony. Come on. You might need to take the hand of your spouse. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Pastor Marvin said earlier, let your expectation level rise this morning. So church, we could come and sing just a couple of songs, or we could come this morning and receive a supernatural divine intervention. So come on, come on, come on. Come and flood this altar. Pastor Brad, lead us in the song. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. We're believing. We're believing. We're believing for divine intervention. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust I will not be shaken. I will build my life upon your It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you. And I Would you open your eyes and look this way? I'm, I'm going to pray in just a moment. Last Sunday night, in our monthly prayer gathering in this auditorium, as I was walking through, as you were praying, the Lord said something to me that I felt the Lord wanted me to share today. And this is what the Lord said to me. These people truly love me. I felt the Lord say to me, these people truly love me. And then I felt the Lord say to me, these people, this church is so hungry for an outpouring of the living God and a supernatural touch. And then I felt the Lord say to me, and he's going to honor your openness to the supernatural. Amen? He's going to honor your openness to the supernatural. God is your shield. He is your reward. He's your protector. He's your provider. And Abram reasoned that even if Isaac died, God's just going to have to bring him back to life. And church, 
I want faith like that that believes for the supernatural. So you're at the front. I want you to lift your hands as high as you can. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pray. And after I pray, I want every one of our pastoral team members and board members and altar workers, get the anointing oil, walk around, anoint these wonderful people. And after I pray, I'm going to step off this platform. And you can stay as long as you want. But if you need to slip out, you, you feel free to be dismissed. And if you're a guest, thank you for coming. Drop by the guest lounge. So Jesus... These people are hungry and thirsty for a supernatural touch. I'm praying in the name of the Lord that sick bodies would be healed. I'm praying. I'm praying that cancer would be gone in the name of Jesus. I'm praying. I'm praying. I'm praying that anxiety would be broken. I'm praying that fear would be broken this morning. I'm praying in the name of Jesus back pain would be gone. I'm praying in the name of Jesus for miracle in every life and everyone standing at the front. I'm praying, God, that we would embrace God ventures. I'm praying in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, that we'd have a faith that is strengthened and not weakened. Jesus, I pray that you would show up right now and do the supernatural. This is your service, Lord, so come, Lord Jesus. Touch people, heal sick bodies, restore brokenness, set people free by the power of you. So God, thank you for this morning. To God be the glory, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead, Pastor Brad. Upon your